the typeface and the spacing and the way your proposals are actually structured. So the RFP from start to finish, if you don't have this experience, please bring somebody into your organization who does so they can advise you either from the legal perspective as you evaluate the scope and then also just to really step back and say, is our organization structured and set up to do this kind of work in the way we need to today? The other really nice thing I think right now with the amount of funding, and I love uh, the take of all three of you on this one as well, as far as all of the work that's coming and the challenges with labor shortages and such, I think it's a great moment for contractors to be very selective about the projects they chase. Yeah. When you look at it, more contractors fail during the good times than the bad times. If you go look at the numbers and the reality is the reason why they fail is they take off, take on more work than they can actually perform in time. It's all about cash flow and uh, the resources that you have and utilizing them efficiently and effectively. And if you take on too much, you can overextend yourself and, and there you go. And then you run out of the manpower, you run out of the cash and it's over. Just as much here, with, we're talking about looking before you leap, watching the terms of the contract. To what Alex was saying before, there's a lot of money here for projects that don't typically get federal funding, whether direct or indirect funding. And what I mean, any sort of grant. Broadband money is does not usually receive federal money. All of a sudden now, if you've got a broadband project, you better know if there's any federal dollars tied to it because then there's federal requirements. You have a lot of sophisticated owners who might understand this, but in the case of with a state DOT, for example, but when you're talking about state and localities looking at broadband and those agencies that are going to be charged with those oversight responsibilities, they might not really understand it and they might not communicate that effectively to the contractor. So it's really on, uh, on the contractor, on those that are, we're the engineers taking on that work to make sure they ask because you don't want it. You don't want to find out after you bid the project and, and then have to pay for it later. All right, well, it sounds like there's a lot of stuff to consider for those contractors out there who are either already fully invested in this type of work and have done these types of projects for federal clients previously. For those that haven't, a lot of stuff to think about to make sure that you're preparing yourself so you know what to expect and are putting the best bids forward when the, the money starts showing up. Alex, I do have a question that might help our listeners narrow their focus as far as where they should be preparing and thinking about what comes next. Is there any insight on which sectors or project types will be included in the first wave of funding that we're thinking about might show up at the end of this year, the very early part of next year? Sure. I think this comes back to, again, what types of infrastructure have received federal funding in the past? Highways and transit have always been the core of a surface transportation reauthorization. It is easiest for USDOT to get that new money out and write the new requirements that have changed from the previous law. I think, again, whenever you get into the new programs that require new formulas with new eligibilities, that all takes time. The only additional thing I would add is we talked earlier about, there was a mention of, of supply chain and and the, how the war in you, with Russia and Ukraine has even further strained that supply chain. So I think at the outset, the administration wanted to get about four and a half billion dollars of the $17 billion dedicated to ports out the door to hopefully ease or at least try to ease some of this supply chain. That's encouraging to hear. And I'd seen a lot of things in the news in the last year where they were showing video of just containers stacked and stacked because there wasn't resourcing to either address that or we had ran into bottlenecks once everything showed up at the same moment. So encouraging to hear that the administration is thinking about that and trying to find ways to assuage those challenges. And for those out there listening, food for thought as far as what you're preparing to catch as some of those funding things roll through. So Ryan, I'm going to kick this next question straight to you as well. And I'd like to open it up for discussion amongst uh, Alex and Jimmy afterwards. Are there any other risks or challenges that our listeners should be aware of as they're evaluating these projects? Like anything that's super obvious that they should make sure they're really considering as they look to all of the new work that's coming their way? Yeah, not to be facetious or anything like that, but there's now there's a whole host of of issues. You have the National Environmental Policy Act, otherwise known as NEPA. So a lot of these projects have to go through federal NEPA environmental impact studies. And in addition to that, wage rates, Davis-Bacon is built into a lot of these federal contracts, if not all of them. Labor shortages, as I think we've talked about earlier, just getting the people to do the work is 
a national problem and not just in the construction and contractor sectors. And then in addition to that, diversity, equity, and inclusion metrics built in to a lot of these proposals. So as people look to bid on these projects, that's going to be something that they're going to need to be cognizant of if they can fulfill those or not. And that's a lot of focus on getting the minority business owners into the federal contracting game as well. I appreciate that point. And, and when I was doing the federal contracting, the organization I worked for, which was later acquired, was a, a minority-owned business. And a lot of the reason why they were able to get some of the work they had was because of those requirements. As we pivoted into large business and were beholden to those requirements ourselves, it was sometimes really difficult to, to fulfill those requirements, especially based on the region or the geos that we were doing. One part of the country might have a lot of organizations that fill those requirements and fit those needs and are prepared to participate in federal contracting. Other ones, not so much. So as you do start evaluating those RFPs that come in, absolutely fantastic point as far as make sure that you have those relationships, who might actually be able to staff that, and you should speak to them to make sure that they're not committed elsewhere, I think an assumption at that moment, especially with the shortages that we have, could bite you at the end of the day if you think you will qualify. And then when things start rolling up, you don't necessarily have all of your ducks in a row. Jimmy, Alex, any other thoughts here as far as the challenges that our listeners might expect as they jump into the, the work that's coming? I was just going to say, we've surveyed our members and they expect the supply ch current supply chain crisis to continue and likely get worse over the next year. And I think one other dynamic we're watching is the expanded Buy America requirements in the bill. I think it could make this matter worse where you have you do have American manufacturers of the product here in the U.S., but suddenly you're now cutting out some of the non-domestic suppliers and putting even, even greater demand on these American manufacturers that already can't keep up. And it does create a window of opportunity to you know, expand domestic manufacturing, which is the goal of these requirements, but that could take years before we could actually see the benefits of that. And to layer on top of what Alex said, it's not just that there's one requirement for the same thing. There's usually multiple requirements. So when we're not just an issue of, is it made in America? Is that material made in America? Is it also environmentally friendly? We, we're looking at the administration's climate goals and trying to find a way to meet those as well. And part of that in an executive order that came out in December was a buy clean initiative where you'd have to take a look at the emissions process and see what was the embedded carbon included in various materials. So now it's a domestic re requirement for production, but also looking at it from a, an environmental standpoint on climate change, you're narrowing and narrowing the window of what's an acceptable material for the project. And that's obviously, it makes sense for different reasons, but will it work in practice at the moment in time we're in is up for debate. It's a fair point because there's so many nuances tied between existing requirements and some of the net new ones in, in that layered conversation. Does it feel like as as organizations like the ones that both of, or all three of you work at are, are raising these issues and, and sharing some of the challenges that our contractors are going to be facing as the funding comes out, will there be some more flexibility to have these meaningful conversations? Or is that just a challenge that we're going to have to navigate as it appears when the funding shows up? I think from our standpoint, we're helping clients navigate that, that process as they start to write the rules. For the, for the funding, we're working with them to talk to the, the departments and agencies that are writing those rules. And there's also a process at the congressional level, too, that they can go back through, you know, the FY23 appropriations process or through other legislative vehicles to clarify and maybe put some more meat on the bones of what this money is intended for. And not to... Not to scare people off, but when, when I mentioned NEPA earlier, and you know, that also can significantly extend the timeline of a project, not only because of the environmental impact statements themselves, but often the litigation that is, that is involved as well. I, I, I have to agree. It's, there's a lot of opportunity in the various rulemaking processes, guidance processes to talk to the agencies. I, I think they're has to be, and they're interested in being flexible. The perfect cannot be the enemy of the good. And as long as the general concepts that are here are being advanced, can we do it in a way 
where it's the the greatest bang for the buck and, and for the environment and for communities is, is something that all has to be in in the balancing act when it comes down to consideration of what's in the public good. So I'm optimistic that we can get there. There's always bumps in the road, but let's get to the finish line. Of course. And and I'm encouraged to hear that you're having those conversations now and those flags are being raised at the moment because it gives us some time to, to hopefully have an impact on ensuring that the requirements and the rules associated with all of these projects are a little bit more fair, especially considering the economic challenges that we're having across the board. And I've got a question coming that we can get into that a little bit deeper in a moment. But uh, is a construction technology and enthusiast here and a bit of a contact nerd, admittedly. I'm always wondering, how does technology play in initiatives like this? And Jimmy, I'd love to kick this one to you to hear your thoughts, the role technology is going to play in this big push for infrastructure. I think the the times and a lot of the discussion that we've already had on whether it's supply chain or especially on the labor side is where can you find more efficiencies? And to find more efficiencies, you're going to have to look at, well, how am I using the people or using the supplies in the most time and cost effective manner? A lot of that involves just project management software. Uh, a lot of that involves drones where I can keep track of various materials or better understand the land that I'm going to be working on. And I, I honestly think that the construction industry is usually said is slow to the intake on technology, but I think the last two years have really sped its intake to take on a lot more, go a lot more out of its comfort zone, so to speak. You have the big contractors, but now you have the small contractors and the subcontractors looking to take advantage of those efficiencies in an absence of more workers and aging workforce to try to find how they can get the job done with even less. You hit the nail on the head from my perspective as far as when the innovation curve that's changed in the last couple of years. I think everybody out there listening is probably tired of getting beaten up about this. Construction's not productive. We've never innovated. That's categorically not Correct. true anymore. Construction is embracing so many new technologies and there's so many cool things that we can do to optimize how we deploy to the project, how we manage our resourcing and all of those great things. So I'm in line with you on that one. I do have a question as far as how the the contracts and the rules within the federal world will facilitate that. And admittedly, my knowledge is about a decade out of date at this point. I have not uh, had the pleasure of responding to a federal RFP. So I'm, I'm very curious how things look today in the, the ecosystem of federal funding. How difficult or not, and I hope it's not, will it be to bring this to these new tools and technologies to the projects within the confines of the requirements that we live in today? I think that you have a situation first off where the bill provides a hundred million dollars of investment for technology in a lot of the traditional infrastructure space for experimentation, pilot programs and the like. You have existing pilot programs or just programs that USDOT that tried to continue to push the bounds of technologies uses in construction and just how we use our various transportation assets. And then there's obviously issues with cybersecurity. And I, I think that's the biggest issue when we're doc talking about doing work for the Department of Defense, the Army Corps the Navy, that's a challenge in working with the federal owner because what might be good for a private company is not necessarily good enough for the Department of Defense, even as a contractor that's just building a barracks, right? Which is essentially a glorified hotel, but it's for the Department of Defense for soldiers that are, that are actively being probed by foreign governments or other types of groups looking for holes. And sometimes that lowest common denominator can be as low as the plumber or the electrical contractor on a job and ensuring those cybersecurity requirements meet the high threshold of DOD is something that 
a lot of contractors might not be used to, but definitely have to consider in this day and age. You're on point there. And even this morning, we're dating when the, the episode is being recorded, but this morning there were news about some potential hackers getting into Okta, which is a 2FA or two-factor authentication platform that many technology companies use across the world. And from what I saw earlier, although I don't know if that's necessarily the case, they assumed that that was actually not accurate as far as them getting into that infrastructure. But it's something that everybody out there listening does need to consider whether you're doing federal work or not, is the digital technologies that you adopt. Make sure you fully understand the requirements and getting your teams up to speed on cybersecurity issues and challenges and what they should think about, because we definitely don't want to put ourselves at risk. And with infrastructure, those risks can go up depending on the type of project that, that we're taking a look at. All right. So I think it would be helpful to hear a little bit more about the bidding process tied to federal work. And I think, I know we covered this a little bit, but specifically looking at offering some more guidance for our listeners to help them decide which projects to bid on. So aside from what we've already discussed, do you have any other recommendations our listeners might consider to help them pick and choose what they should bid on as the funding starts to become available? I think one of the big things we're hearing right now from our members is the supply chain crisis, the um, availability of materials, the price escalation. So the first thing I would point out would be, you know, checking to see, is there a price escalation clause available? This varies among agencies across the government, whether it is available or not. I know it's been a practice at Federal Highways where they've had guidance out on just how to do these price escalation clauses, including, you know, if the price goes down, how to protect the taxpayer. I think that's the most important thing we're hearing from our members right now. And for those out there listening, can you define a little bit more clearly what that, that clause actually empowers or enables in a contract? Sure. Go and you bid a project and let's say steel costs $10 and concrete's 15 Six months to a year later, when you go to actually build the contract, steel's now $22, concrete's 28 And what are you supposed to do if you don't have a price escalation clause in place? You're going to maybe try to delay as long as you can in starting construction, hoping that those prices come down. So it's really important to check into that right now, especially as we're in this supply chain crisis. I really appreciate that context. And for everybody out there, make sure that you take a peek there, because I think that's a bit of your safety net, especially when the guidance and the guidelines are a bit more rigid with this type of work versus what you may have experienced in the commercial world, if that's the type of uh, project type that you've taken on historically. Really important element. Ryan, Jimmy, any other thoughts there as far as the bidding process and helping people decide which projects they should be chasing? I'll, I'll go to the question of, is it a design build project, design bid build project? What do you, you know, project delivery matters in these cases and you want to be able to assume the appropriate risks or make sure your owner is going to share at, or allocate those risks appropriately. Ryan pointed out a great one in design build. You can take on environmental risks for which you as a contractor and designer have absolutely very little ability to control. You do not control the federal government's ability to uh, approve or not approve a permit. And all of a sudden you're waiting for that permit and time is money to you, although sometimes it doesn't seem like it is for the government. Those That's going to come to bear for you later. So maybe talking to the owner in certain cases, does it make sense to go design bid build as opposed to design build are things that in a market where you can choose your contracts, I think that there is going to be more negotiation with the owner on the source, the selection of the project delivery method they go with. This is an environment where the, the government estimate is usually factors of four or five off of what reality is because they're using economic data from five years ago. I remember in 2015, they were still using economic data from 2008 recession, and it is a totally different world. So uh, unfortunately, the, when you look at this, you have to make sure that those owners are actually work, living in the now as opposed to the back then. It's a really fair point, and I appreciate you mentioning the fact that we do get to be picky right now as far as where we go, because in that environment, the owners are well aware of it as well, and especially with shortages tied to labor and supply and all these other fun things. Hopefully, in some instances, is our, our contractors are more empowered to drive those conversations and make a little bit of change to the, the terms that you're signing up for before you actually sign up on the dotted line. So being very firmly involved in the contracting, 
hopefully there's some flexibility to ensure you're picking the delivery method that is the best suited for that type of project. Really great points to, to consider as you look at all of the RFPs that are out there in the ether to be bid on and, and picking the right ones that suit the needs of, uh, of your business. And the other thing that I'll always think about when I was still living in, in that world is Make sure you're really honest with yourself if you really truly meet the requirements of the RFP. So we talked about supplier diversity and things along those lines, but that extends to what projects have you done, what types of projects in size and scope and region and all sorts of different nuances that can be included in the RFP requirements that come from the federal government. They're typically pretty stringent about how those are applied. So if they say you must have had done five $20 million projects or greater in the last five years to qualify for this, and you've done three, you probably shouldn't bid on that project because they're just going to look at it and go, you don't tick that box. And it's a reason for you to be disqualified from the proposal where somebody else might actually meet those requirements. So I'm going to just come back to fully understand what they're asking, ensure that you provide it both in the proposal that you offer, but you're also super honest about if you truly have the capabilities that are necessary to just be compliant with the RFP request. All right. We've touched on this a little bit, but I'd like to come back to it and also keeping that contracting element that we've been talking about here for for this part of the conversation. And it comes back to the the market volatility, inflation, economic concerns, of course, the pandemic is ongoing. There is unfortunately a conflict in Ukraine that's driving a lot of the economic challenges we're seeing today. What is the trajectory of the funding, the projects tied to it looking like with that in mind? And how can our contractors hopefully mitigate some of those risks? And Ryan, I'd love it if you could take a stab at this one first. Yeah, I think that the contractors just need to be be realistic about what their costs are and utilize those escalation escalation clauses. But there's a lot here to consider. You know, you mentioned, you know, where we have inflation at a, at a 40 year high, we've had historic gas prices. A lot of states and even the federal government right now are, are, are discussing and talking about gas tax holidays. Any money tied to the highway trust fund could be at risk. If there is a, uh, if there's a federal gas tax holiday, the money going into the highway trust fund from that gas tax and projects funded through that could be at risk down the road. You know, interest rates, how are they going to continue to go up, go down and not really down, I think at this point, but more up to control inflation. And that obviously has an impact on the access to capital. And then we throw in the continuing global pandemic. Is there another variant? What does that do and how does that slow down projects? And ultimately the supply chain that we continue to talk about. So there's a lot of variables here. And I think contractors, as they look toward bidding and getting involved in the federal process, just need to be cognizant of all of these. You make a, so many good points. And, and I also just want to reiterate too, like, we're speaking about these things very briefly and how they impact like a, ver a, a niche element of our economy as far as construction goes. But I, I don't want to make light of how challenging this moment is for essentially everybody across the world. So I, I appreciate the, the context on how some of this might wrap up into what our listeners are doing and how it might impact the work they're doing. Also, fortunately, We've been living in a state of turmoil, to put it lightly, for about two years now. So hopefully building on that experience, regardless of the type of work that you've been doing, will make its way into how you approach these projects that are coming out. But it's a lot to consider. and I think it can be a little bit overwhelming at times, but also everybody's kind of in the same boat. So I think we're all navigating it the best we can as conditions change what it feels like on, on a daily basis right now. Look, we just had sanctions on Russian oil that drove the price of oil up dramatically. You might be able to say that's a change of law as a result of that, that impacted the price of oil that has impacted your projects. So maybe a change of law can fall under a change order and covering those prices. It might be a Hail Mary, but if you're in that position, you might want to take that shot. You know, if you're lucky enough to go and see this before, you know, you're looking at 
throwing out the fact that you have the ability to shorten the time period, your bid is valid. An agency might come back and give me your best and final offer. Well, how long do, do I hold it? 270 days. I don't have two days to hold my prices with my suppliers. You're asking for 270 days. Uh, then there's also the idea of, you know, again, getting there early and talking to the owner and saying, let's break these projects into smaller phases. I don't know what's going to happen next month, let alone in three years. And you have so many of these projects on the infrastructure side that are multi-year. Can we break it down into smaller phases? That's a good way to make those projects more attractive. Prefabrication. What can we build elsewhere and then ship it in to save time and, and money, taking it from the site, taking it from the manufacturers and bringing it in? We've seen a lot of changes with prefab, whether it's on the building side or on the, the transportation side. Uh, with bridges and then contingency define it all these agencies have contingency ask them what they're going to what they're having that contingency for and try to agree that you can use it for some of these escalations you have to communicate up and down the chain no matter what whether it's good times or bad but these are all things that you can do to help with the current crises put them in perspective and hopefully have your prayers answered. All of really great points to consider is, is you look at this type of work and, and are looking to bid it. And the uncertainty is likely not going to change in the immediate term. There was two things you mentioned, Jimmy, that I, I found particularly interesting just looking at my own experience. One was the phasing of projects. And so the work that we were doing, most of it was phased in its execution. We found that to be really manageable because there were a lot of change conditions tied to the work that we were doing. I think it's a great option, especially trying to make sure that we're not stretching things into a five-year project and beholden to terms that started in two months or six months or something along those lines. But what I am also curious about is the contract types that we're seeing. And I know there's cost reimbursable or cost plus fixed fee, lowest price technically acceptable, firm fixed price. There's all sorts of expectations from the government and it changes tied to economic conditions and the type of work that you're looking at. What might we see as this funding starts rolling out in this particular scope with infrastructure, how should our, our listeners be considering those project types to make sure that they're bidding correctly? Loaded question, yeah, I apologize. I, I, <laughs> I think it's less the contractors uh, and the engineers and anyone else that's bidding this work. Uh, it's more for the government, the procurement officers. I think they're gonna have to learn the hard way and many of them are, whether they're state DOTs, the Army Corps, and other, they're not getting bids. They'll put out yeah. a solicitation on some of these things, firm fixed price, hard bid, and then get up get. That's the worst thing you can possibly get outside of just getting one contractor and calling it a sole source contract when you're looking for competitive bids. And I really do think we're going to see a lot more of that coming from the agencies because they don't really understand, not all of them do, but some of them do, what's happening and the risk appetite in this current environment for the private sector to try to say, I can hold my prices for five years or for this three-year project. They're already operating as the world's greatest hoarders in the construction industry. <laughs> They're taking all of these materials, building warehouses so that they can store the steel, aluminum, and everything else that's hard to get or has increased or doubled in price in the last year. So I do think that there's, you're going to have a point where the agencies are going to have to learn the hard way before they come to the table. And we're starting to see that already happen. That makes a lot of sense. And I appreciate you level setting on kind of what's going on in the current climate. And I do remember when I was still doing this way back when, there was a pivot from a lot of cost reimbursable work to firm fixed price. And most of the contractors that were in the space that we were supporting slowly backed away from those projects because somebody tried to buy the project and then got very badly burned because they realized that the change order process is just a little different and request for equitable adjustment doesn't fill the gap in the way that you might have expected. They just weren't getting bids. So there might be one or two and the price misalignment between those bids could be two or three or four X because the, the contractors who were willing to put out the bids said, gosh, this is an uncertain environment. So we're going to fill this with contingency because it's a firm fixed price contract. So hopefully all of the agencies in the United States are listening to this conversation right now and will make some adjustments in how they approach rolling out 
all of the uh, the RFPs that are going to be coming in the next 6 to 12 to 24 months. But I'd like to close out our episode this week with a question that all of our listeners are very familiar with. And I love asking of all of our guests because we get some really cool and fun responses. Jimmy, I'm going to put you in the hot seat first on this one. What is one tool that you will always carry in your toolbox, no matter what type of project you're working on? It's not technology, it's patience. And my, I'll bring my listening ears with my patience. Because I, I find that if you go into a, a project, whether it's a construction project, whether it's a project with your team, if you're not willing to have patience and, and be a good listener, you're going to come in and uh, find a project gone bad real soon. So that's my answer and I'm sticking to it. I, I'm right there with you. I mean, so much of construction is rooted in communication and collaboration. And if those that are leading those initiatives, especially when there's a lot of people participating in a project, either through joint ventures or specialty contractors and subcontractors or anything, if you're not patient, especially when the market and the challenging economic conditions that we're seeing are present, like you just said, there's going to be some challenges that come as a result of that. So I appreciate that take a uh, very valuable tool. Ryan, how about you? It's your turn in the hot seat. What's one tool that you'll bring to every project that, uh, that you work on? Good shoes. And I, I say that because especially as we start to come out of the pandemic and as capital starts to open again and federal agencies open again. I'm going to be doing a lot of walking, talking to members of Congress, talking to members, you know, uh, staff of the administration to, to advocate on behalf of my clients. So always have good shoes. That's my favorite answer we've had in a while, actually, because it's, it's so relevant in no matter who's listening right now, it's appropriate because like you said, you're out there, you're walking around and in, in meeting with people. But I, I also think about the steel toe boots that I have in my closet that I bought when I was 19 years old and they still fit and they're still great because I spent $300 on them. So get a good dang pair of shoes. And uh, I think you're going to be setting yourself up for, uh, for success, regardless of if you're out at a project or a conference or uh, walking the, the halls of Congress. And that's a, that's an awesome answer. Alex, how about you? Any, any particular tool that you carry to every project you're working on? I'd love to hear it. Mine is not a fun and exciting answer, but a notebook and pen. Things come up, you get feedback, new tasks, and I have a terrible memory and just have to write everything down. I like it. I, I admire anybody who can sustain that as well. There's been a number of times in my life where I've bought the, the coolest little notebook, something that fits in my pocket, fancy pen that isn't going to leak everywhere. And I carry it for about four days and then it goes into the box where all the other notebooks and pens that I bought with that exact initiative go and unfortunately die a, a sad, neglected death. That's excellent. Keeping tabs on everything you're working on. I, I appreciate the uh, the insight into uh, into your favorite tool. I know all of you are working on some cool stuff. There's a lot of things in the mix, especially as we're starting to move back into in-person events across the industry. Is there anything that each of you would like to plug or share with our listeners? Sure. Well, we're going uh, down next week to Grapevine, Texas, outside of Dallas for the AGC National Convention. That's the last week of March, and hopefully we'll see a lot of friends and uh, more people on this podcast there. Awesome. Will any of the materials from that be available to our listeners if they're unable to attend? Is there a, like an after event? Yes, of anything we'll be no? doing our own podcasts with various members attending and, and talking about a lot of issues, just like we're talking about here. Fantastic. So everybody out there listening, if you're not able to make it in time, there's still going to be a ton of great content for you to jump on. So pop over to AGC's website or their social media. I'm sure you can dig up a bunch of that. Ryan, how about yourself? Anything you'd like to share with our listeners? Yeah, I want to go back to talk about, we have a client here at Shoemaker and it's a Rev1 Energy. They have a product called, or, or Tracker Technologies. It's an enterprise level project, project management, digitization, and, and different phases in their Tracker prep, tracker check, and tracker run different programs. And it's a way that typically they've been active in the energy sector, but they're getting involved in a, a lot more sectors. And it's just as we, as we talk about how to manage projects cost effectively and efficiently with our time there, they offer some great technology to help contractors do that. Awesome. Do they, uh, do they have specific feature sets tied to the, the federal space as well? So those that they're listening, bidding on all this new work can, uh, can make sure to pull that in as they're optimizing their processes and resources. Well, what's good about, about the company is a lot of it is 
is customizable to the to whomever they're working with. Awesome. Sounds like there's a lot uh, a lot of potential there. So I, I appreciate that, Ryan. All right, Alex, is there anything you'd like to share with our listeners as far as uh, cool stuff coming up? No, it just continues um, my day to be full of tracking progress on implementation of this infrastructure bill, um, alerting our members of funding opportunities out there, rulemakings, new guidance documents, and making sure they're aware and in the loop on them. Awesome. If you're looking for more information and you're out there listening, AGC is definitely a great source. They're definitely out there advocating for all the different contractors. And as you've just heard in this conversation, really great perspective on what you're signing up for when you jump into the federal world specifically. So I'm appreciative of all of your guidance and advice uh, in this conversation and then everything else that's out there in the ether. Our listeners would like to reach out to each of you. Is there a great way to contact you? Jimmy, how about you start? Jimmy, J-I-M-M-Y dot Christensen, C-H-R-I-S-T. I-A-N-S-O-N at A-G-C dot org. Awesome. Sounds like Jimmy is excited to get your email. So if you've got any questions, reach straight out to him and he's uh, he's there for you. Ryan, how about you? What's the best way to get a hold of you? Best way is, is email as well. It's rwalker at shoemaker, S-H-U-M-A-K-E-R advisors, A-D-V-I-S-O-R-S dot com. Awesome. It sounds like you can add two people to that email uh, distribution if you've got any questions. Alex, how about you? What's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Uh, and I'll keep the roll going. It's um, A-L-E-X-E-T-C-H-E-N at A-G-C dot org. Awesome. It sounds like everybody is excited to get your emails today, which is cool. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us on this episode of Autodesk's Digital Builder Podcast. If you've got any questions or want to suggest a guest for a future episode, the best way to find me would be on LinkedIn or via Twitter at Builder underscore digital. Also, if you're enjoying the show, please take a moment to rate us out on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player. Spotify just opened up a new rating feature. So all you've got to do is open up the app and select whatever stars and write whatever you feel is appropriate. Super easy and does make a real difference for our our team on the back end as far as bumping us up the charts and really widening the net on the interesting content that we're able to bring to the construction industry at large. And on that final note, goodbye. You've been listening to Digital Builder. To ensure that you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast player. If you're listening with Apple Podcasts, we'd love for you to give a quick rating of the show. Simply tap the number of stars you think the podcast deserves, and then you're done. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.